Right, the final topic for this week is a little bit different, um, but is certainly important and it's about matrices, so I thought I'd include it in this week as well. And this is about what are known as special matrices. These are matrices which have some kind of symmetry property. Okay, And the first three I'm going to define are based upon the idea of transpose, which we defined in the previous video. So remember that you can define if you've got a matrix A, then you can define the matrix A transpose, where you take the rows and replace them by columns. Okay. So, let me, okay, let me define these special symmetry properties. So the first one you can have is that the transpose doesn't change the matrix. So A is equal to A of T. So if this is true, then we call the matrix symmetric. Then A. symmetric. Okay, so here's a very simple example. So this means that the rows of A must be the same as the columns of A, right? So if I have a row 1, 2, 3, sorry, if I have a column 1, 2, 3, then I must have the same thing on the row. And here if I have a column 2, minus 1, 4, then I must have the same thing on the row here. And then, okay, this one can be anything. So this is a symmetric matrix. You notice that the rows are the same as the columns. Or another way of looking at it is if you reflect along the diagonal here, then the things above and below the diagonal are the same. Right? Above the diagonal I have 2, 3, 4. Below the diagonal I have 2, 3, 4. So that defines a symmetric matrix. Next is if you get minus. So if A is equal to minus the transpose of A, then you could probably get sorry. Then A is called anti-symmetric, as you might have guessed. Okay, so a simple example of an anti-symmetric matrix. This means that the rows must be minus the columns. So in other words, if the row has minus one and two here, if the columns <laughs> If the column is minus 1 and 2 here, then the row must have 1 here and minus 2 there. Now notice that the only thing that I can put here is 0, because this column must be equal to minus this row, and therefore 0 must be equal to minus 0, right? which is true, but it's only true for 0. So for the same reason, you must have 0 here and you must have 0 there. So for an anti-symmetric matrix, the diagonal elements are all 0. Okay, and then again, let's have 3 here. Then you must have minus 3 there. Okay, so that's an anti-symmetric matrix. And again, you can see it, it means diagonals are 0. And what you have above is minus what you have below. So here above, you have 1, minus 2, 3. Then below, you have minus 1, 2, 3. That's an anti-symmetric matrix. Okay, and finally, if A is equal to A transpose inverse, okay, seems a bit complicated, but this is very important, then A is called orthogonal. Okay, so it's a bit harder to give an example of this in three dimensions. I'll do a two by two matrix example of this. Suppose that you have the matrix cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cos theta for some value of theta. Okay, so then you take the transpose that gives you this. Okay. And then you take the inverse, so you divide by the determinant, which is cos squared theta plus sine squared theta, and then you swap these, cos theta, cos theta, and multiply these by minus 1, sine theta, minus sine theta. Okay, but this is obviously equal to 1, so this is equal to cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta which is equal to A. Okay. So that's an example of an orthogonal matrix. Okay, so 
And using this idea of transpose, you can define these three kinds of special matrices. Symmetric matrices satisfy this, anti-symmetric matrices satisfy that, and orthogonal matrices satisfy this. Okay, now I'm going to do three more kinds of special matrix which are related to these, and these are for complex matrices. So a complex matrix a complex matrix is just a matrix where the elements are complex numbers. So for example, 1 plus i, 2 minus 3i, 2i, 1 minus 2i, 2 plus i, 1 minus i. That is a complex matrix. Okay, it's a matrix with complex numbers in. Now for complex matrices, you can define the something known as the adjoint matrix. So the adjoint of matrix A is the transpose and complex conjugate of all elements. So you write this adjoint as A with a dagger up here. Okay, that defines this is the symbol for adjoint of A. Okay, so for example, if I take this one, A transpose is one plus I, so swap the rows into columns. Okay, that's the transpose, and then to find the adjoint, unfortunately the symbols look rather similar, don't they? But you have to be careful, this one is not the same as this one. This is like a, a cross here, whereas this is a capital T. So to get the adjoint, you take complex conjugate of everything. That means you replace all the i's by minus i. So this then is 1 minus i, 2, 2 minus i, 2 minus i, 1, 3i. 1 plus 2i, i. So that defines the adjoint. Okay, And similarly to the special matrices for the transpose, you can define special matrices for the adjoint with complex matrices. So namely, if a complex matrix is the same as its adjoint, then A is called, so this is like the equivalent of symmetric, complex numbers this is called for complex matrices this is called Hermitian okay I think this is named after the guy who did who first studied these things okay and if a is equal to minus a dagger a dagger this is red by the way so the adjoint is a dagger so if a is equal to minus a dagger then a is called anti Hermitian Okay, and finally, if A is equal to A dagger inverse, then A is called unitary. Okay. So these three properties, three special matrices, Hermitian, anti-Hermitian, unitary, for complex matrices are the equivalents of symmetric, anti-symmetric, and orthogonal for real matrices. So you might wonder why we define all these things, and it turns out that these special matrices are very useful. I'm going to be able to tell you much more about why that is next week, after we do next week's topic. But for now, I just want to show you one example. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this video is explain why orthogonal matrices, so this is where matrices where the transpose inverse is the same as the original matrix, why are these matrices useful? So suppose we have a matrix
And I can consider A as being made up of n vectors, which are columns. So I'm going to call this V1. That's the first column. V2, which is the second column, all up to Vn. Okay. And suppose this is true in some orthonormal basis. I1, I2, up to In. So this is some basis for n-dimensional space. And according to this basis, the transformation A has the matrix like this. OK. Now, what does it mean if A is orth orthogonal? So if A is orthogonal, then, by definition, a is equal to a transpose minus 1. But this means that a minus 1 is equal to a transpose. Okay, just take the inverse of this equation. But this means that a times a transpose should be equal to the identity matrix. So that's the matrix with zeros everywhere except for down the diagonal, right? But what does this mean? A is, OK, so for reasons which will be current in a minute, let's consider it the other way around, A transpose A. The inverse, it works both ways, right? So this and this are both equal to the identity. But here I want to consider this one. Right, so A transpose is the same matrix, but with the columns replaced by the rows. So now I'm going to have the vectors V1, V2, up to Vn in the rows of this one, A transpose, and I'm going to have V1, V2, up to Vn in the columns here. And I want this to be equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, this matrix. OK. But you can see what this is when you multiply it out. The first element here is just going to be the scalar product of this and this. In other words, it's going to be v1 dot v1. Okay. The second element here is going to be this dot that. So it's going to be v1 dot v2. The next one is v1 dot v3. All the way up to v1 dot Vn, then going down here you have v2 dot v1, v2 dot v2, okay, I can't be bothered to do any more, down to vn dot v1, vn dot v2, v2 dot vn, all the way down here, vn dot vn. And if A is orthogonal, then this matrix here, because I'll get rid of that, is equal to this matrix here. So what this means is if I have Vi and I scale the product Vj, then this is equal to 1 if i is equal to j, okay? and it's equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. Right? Because the diagonal elements are where i equals j, and those are all 1. And the off-diagonal elements are where i is not equal to j, and those are all 0. Right, so you have this. But what does this mean? vi dot vi is just the length of vi. Right? So this means that vi length is 1 for all i, from 1 up to n. And what does it mean if the dot product is 0? That means that the angle is 90 degrees. In other words, they are perpendicular. So in other words, Vi is perpendicular to Vj for all i not equal to j. But this, these two conditions, that the length are equals to 1 and all the vectors are perpendicular, was the condition on a basis to be orthonormal. right? So therefore, what this means is that the basis v1, v2 up to vn 
is also orthonormal. So that's a very important result. If the matrix is orthogonal, and I consider these columns of the matrix as being vectors, then these vectors form an orthonormal basis. So I can draw that as a picture. So I'll just do three dimensions, because I can only draw in three dimensions. Suppose I've got this orthogonal basis here, orthonormal basis here, i, j, and k. Then when I apply the transformation a, i is mapped into the vector v1, j is mapped into the vector v2, and k is mapped into the vector v3. But these vectors will still be orthonormal, so all these angles are still 90 degrees, okay, and all these lengths are still 1. So there aren't many transformations for which this is, for which this is true. Okay, which preserve all of these angles and lengths. And in fact, there's only two possibilities. Either A is a rotation, because right, if I take these three basis vectors and I just rotate, then obviously that preserves the orthonormality, preserves the lengths and angles, or it can be a reflection. That's the only other opposite. It can be a reflection of these two bases, right? which also works. So what this means is that transformations, rotations, or reflections correspond to orthogonal matrices. So reflections and rotations correspond to orthogonal matrices. Okay, so that's an important conclusion. We can say just one more thing about this. What is the determinant of a orthogonal matrix? Okay, well, we know that A times A transpose is equal to i. So this means that the determinant of a times a transpose is equal to the determinant of i. But one of the properties of determinant is that the determinant of a times b is equal to the determinant of a times the determinant of b. So b here, sorry. b here is a transpose. And the determinant of the identity matrix is 1, obviously, because it doesn't change the volume. But it's also quite easy to check that the determinant of A is the same as the determinant of A transpose. Because right? all the transpose does is swap rows and columns. That doesn't change the calculation of determinant. So det A squared is equal to 1. So that means that the determinant of A is either plus or minus 1. So orthogonal matrices either have determinant 1 or they have determinant minus 1. And you can also show that if determinant of A is 1, then it's a rotation. And if the determinant of A is minus 1, then it's a reflection. Okay. The reason for this is also not too difficult to understand. Why is rotation... Why should rotations have determinant equal to plus 1? This is because rotations are a continuous transformation. What this means is if I start with basis vectors like this, i and j, and then I rotate through an angle theta, so I end up with new basis vectors like this. So this is the rotation of i and the rotation of j then it's always possible to make this rotation of angle theta by lots of small rotations, right? I can very slowly rotate each of these basis vectors around, right? So if I start off with basis vectors like that, and I end up with basis vectors like that, 
then you can do this as a series of very small rotations, right? Little bit by little bit by little bit. Okay. Now, because of the way the determinant is defined, it must be a continuous function of theta, right? And therefore, the identity, which is the zero rotation, we know that has to terminate equal to one. But therefore, because the determinant is a continuous function, each small rotation must also have determinant equal to 1. And therefore, the large rotation must also have determinant equal to 1. Okay? There's no place as I rotate, determinant is 1, determinant is 1, determinant is 1. At no point can it change to minus 1, because it must be a continuous function. On the other hand, reflections do not have this property, right? A reflection is I start out with a basis like this, and then I end up with a basis like that. Okay? This is not a continuous transformation. You can't make a rotation out of lots of small rotations. Oh, sorry, you can't make a reflection out of lots of small reflections. That doesn't make any sense. In the same way that you can make a rotation out of lots of small rotations. So therefore, the determinant of a rotation must be equal to 1, whereas the determinant of a reflection does not have to be equal to 1.